and welcome to Rugby Works Talks, our podcast, where we talk to interesting people who have perspectives on everything from sports to equality, inclusion. And I am absolutely uh, delighted to work to welcome Shauna Brown here today because she has an opinion on all of that and more. Welcome, well, Shauna. Thank you for having me, Zena. Yeah, you're right. I, I rarely sit on the fence, probably mainly because I'm so heavy and would break most fences. So <laughs> I have to be on one side or the other. Well, let's start off with a bit of the history of you. And um, having Googled you, you're super impressive, aren't you? Shot put, you, you, had, you had a little go at boxing, you rugby capped for England 30 times, I think, was it? Yeah, 30 times. Yeah, 30 times cap for England in rugby, but you didn't start playing that till slightly later. What what gave you your drive for sport first? Because you, you competed in the Commonwealth in shot put. Yeah, well, I competed in the Commonwealth Games 2014 in the hammer throw, which oh. I didn't start till later on in my athletics. So it was always shot put and discus were my two main events. And as a junior, I went to World Junior Games, um, youth, World Youth Games, European Junior Championships and then my first senior international cap for athletics was in Hammerthrow. And then to answer your question in terms of where I get my drive from, I get asked that quite a lot. And like just at a guess, I really enjoy winning. And I remember the feeling of the first time I ever won something was at primary school. And do you remember micro scooters when they first came out? I do. But all the rage and they were like over a hundred pounds. And I saved for weeks and months to get one. And I found the cheapest one, but I think everyone else's was like 100 quid. And I found one on Peckham High Street for about 40 quid. And it was sports day at, at primary school. And for the first time, we had a scooter race. Now, I've never been fast at running. I don't, I've always been active. I've always been into sport. But just straight out running, I have never, ever been fast. And I'm I'm OK with that. So... I just assumed I would enter this scooter race and sort of be middle of the pile, like with everything else. But it's t I won. And I was like, I've never won a race in my life. And I just remember that feeling of, of winning. And yeah, it, it stays with me now. So it will be a lot to do with, with that bit. But also, I just like really like being active. I like to challenge my mind. I like to do new things. I like to put myself outside of the comfort zone and be be a person that people are proud to know. That's amazing. But the, the sports you went into initially, they're quite scooter racing, obviously, your first love. Um, but it's, you know, your shot put, javelin, hammer throwing. They're slightly niche, aren't they? they they're not your mainstream football netball. What, what, why? How? Yeah, so I was, I was in quite a small school, Addy and Stanhope in, in New Cross, and a lot of the girls didn't want to do any sport, so I would just do PE with, with the boys, which was always fine by me. But when it comes to competition and mm. going to a club on a weekend, like you can't, we can't do that. Um, and to the point, my, my PE teacher, I remember recently like reconnecting with him and he would say, he, which I didn't realise at the time, he used to have to write off when we'd have school competitions, he would have to write to the opposition team and essentially get permission for me to play because we were over the age of 11 and because I was the girl on the team um, and officially we weren't allowed to, but it was at a discretion of, of this teacher and that teacher. And so, yeah, he used to write off and they would always say yes the first time around and then we'd go and they'd see me play. And then the next time we'd go to play the same school, they, they would say no. And it would be because I was the best player on the team. <laughs> and it's like, well, I don't know how to take that. Obviously, it's a huge compliment. But at the same time, I just want to play football. And so, yeah, I grew up a lot want, wanting, wishing I could play football, but never found enough girls to play with. So athletics came around because it's essentially a sport I could do by myself and I would yeah. own competition as opposed to teammates. And yeah, it just really took off from there and, and being able to, all I had to worry about is getting myself somewhere and finding myself a coach. And as long as I could get a train or a bus to there, because mum never drove. And so growing up, we, we didn't have a car, et cetera. But it was, yeah, about finding a sport I could do almost completely alone and just needing competition to go against. I mean, that's, I, I do think, I mean, certainly my own experience, I played football till I was 11 and then hit exactly the same thing as you. Um, and I did have a few when I got to secondary school, sort of letters, you know, could I play? Um, and I played in goal and I'd, I'd um, 
I'd, I'd, let's say I'd become a little bit more developed by what was then, you know, you, you were going into what was then year one, it would now be year 11, um, <clears throat> in the first year of secondary school. And the same thing would happen. They'd let me play once, but then none of the boys wanted to strike against me, which is what made me such a good goalie. Actually, if you took away the boobs, I was rubbish. Um, but clearly you were you were talented at sport in a way that I, I never was. Uh, so you're getting into individual athletics. Was there anyone that inspired you from the athletics clubs that you joined um, or from where you went? Or was it really down to your self-motivation? It, it started with mum because she was the one who who like allowed me and enabled me to get into it. So I went to my local athletics track, Lady World Athletics Track down in, in South East London for mini marathon trials, which I was sent to by my school. But then once I was there, it, it was the coaches. So it started off with... Um, Michelle, who was the sprint coach, and I used to sprint with with the group because there was only a sprint group down there. It wasn't the main track, but then she did introduce me to the club coach, and then that's Herbie. And then from there, I moved on to to who the guy who essentially made me the the thrower I, I became, and that was John Hillier. And he is a a man who ultimately became the father figure in my life because he's the guy who phones me up to tell me off when I've not played very well or he's the one who checks in on me and seeing how things are and um, so yeah just having that influence from John from the age of 13 he always knew whatever I did there would always be more and no matter where I got to there was more and I, I really like um, putting that onto other people as well and getting them to realize no matter how well you're doing or actually not well as some would see it that you're you're capable of more you're capable of more than you could ever dream of but you just have to put the time the energy and the thought into it brilliant absolute shout out to john who no doubt will listen to this and i expect he's he's inspired more than you so oh uh, possibly, yeah yeah so so big shout out here to john so you you're got this career mapped out you're off to the commonwealth games What's the switch? What happened? So I, I'd always worked alongside my athletics because that's that's what sport was f for me then. And I had a lot of support from British Gas during my, my lead up to the Commonwealth Games. And they cut my hours down and, and let me have loads of benefits that nobody had really ever got before. Um, but then Commonwealth Games came and went and I, I made it to the final, but I didn't throw very well and I'd made loads of changes in life. Like I said, cut cut down my hours at work and I'd changed coaches and I'd changed loads of elements and it still wasn't working out. Do you know, I always said to myself, like, I'm not getting paid to, to throw a hammer, discus or shot. And the moment I fall out of love of it, there's literally no point. So I just got to that stage of thinking, like, why, why am I doing this anymore? And I thought I've been to Commonwealth Games, like that's pretty cool. Most people haven't done that, so I can I can finish here. Um, but I try I carried on for a sort of another year-ish or so, and then I was just like, nah, I need to tap out because I'm not I'm not loving life here anymore. And if, if I was still progressing, that that's a reason to stay in, but I wasn't, I was going stale. So I actually told myself I was going to retire from sport and be a normal person and get a job, go to work, come home, have my dinner, watch a bit of TV, go to bed and do the same again. Well, that lasted a solid two weeks. And I thought, I can't do this. This is boring. Because I'm only 25 at this point as well. There must be something out there I can do, even if it's just once a week. Like, not anything serious, but just a hobby, an activity. I just needed something. And, and that was when I got into rugby. I didn't know about any clubs. Like, uh, we weren't a rugby family at all whatsoever. Nobody, even my family, like, they come and support me all of the time. But I'm not sure they could tell you how many players are on a pitch at a time <laughs> not sure they could tell you how many minutes are in a game but they can tell you if they had a great day out they can tell you what the cues at the bar were like they can tell you if the food was any good so yeah not not from a rugby family at all but just just kind of got into it because it was offered as a taster session at college once and I I was encouraged to like hit people and I was, I, I was just what do you mean? I could just run because it and it was only it was a PE A level six form, and there was only maybe six or eight of us, and it was me and one other girl when we were mixed with the boys, and it was all very confined, and we was overage, so that was allowed. And there was like, you can hit them harder, and I was like, what? And it was just like piggyback races, jumping on each other's backs, um, wheel wheelbarrow races, 
um, like the, the fight you do on the floor when you try and grab wrists and the knee slaps and all of that thing. And I was just, this is allowed. And not only is it allowed, it's encouraged. Well, <laughs> where has this sport been all my life? So yeah, just started going to Medway once a week because that's all they trained once a week and the rest is history, as they say. Really impressive history. So let's let's get into some of that rugby. I love the fact that you really do it because you want to hit people. Oh, I think that's fantastic. <laughs> rugby is all things to all people. Well, what I love about rugby is it's it's all things to all sizes. It's yeah. the only team sport I can think of where no matter what your body shape is, there's actually a genuine place for you in that team. Yeah. Um, so when I talk about rugby and I'm talking to people about, you know, what Rugby Works does and why as a charity, I think that particular sport is important. One of my main factors is it's genuinely inclusive. Yeah. And yeah. you haven't ruled yourself out in the majority of cases by the time you're 11, 12, 13, which a lot of people have with football. You either know your position um, or you've ruled yourself out because you're just not good enough because there's there's so much of it around when you're growing up. Whereas mm -hmm. for most kids still, there isn't much rugby around. So, so you, you opt in and you find a position. Dealing with acrylic nails for some of the girls, challenges, I found ways around that. But I do think from well, that perspective, it's, it's, I, I can tell you, it's an inclusive sport. Anyway, going back to you, you're 25. You have had a taster of rugby when you were a kid and, and knew you liked hitting people. You phone up Medway or email them and say, I want to come and play. What's the rest of the journey? How do you end up with 30 England caps? Um, the highlights turned up. The first thing, the coach, like after the first session, the coach was like, you can catch and you can run and you can throw because I couldn't pass. I was like, yeah. Like, I assumed everyone could do that. And he's like, no. And he said, you're going to be good. I was like, well, I hope so, because I'm pretty good at most things that I do. So, and that's my mindset. So even now, when I do something, I expect to be good at it. And if I'm not, I am fuming. Um, and then fast forward to March of 2015, um, went to watch, uh, and I say fast forward, it was a few months later, went to watch a England women's Six Nations game. And I just remember like nudging my mum. I was like, I reckon I could do that. I said, if I walked out on that pitch now, I don't think anybody would know I haven't got a clue what I'm doing because I'd just catch the ball and run into people. And that seems to be what they're attempting to do. And so she just went, yeah, all right. Because mum is used to me. She's used to me being good at stuff. She's used to me excelling. She's also used to me saying things and then doing it. And almost in a stubborn, hard-headed way, like, she's just like, okay, whatever. Just like, just do it. So... That was the moment I decided in my head, I'm going to play rugby for England and I'm going to do whatever it takes. And, and, and previous to that, I told myself I would just play at Medway. I was having fun mm. a couple of days a week at training, a Sunday game, not too seriously. It was only down the road, like 15 minutes from my house, which I'd not been used to. I'd always been used to traveling for training. Um, but then that game happened. I decided I wanted to play for England. And that's when things changed. And that's when I started exploring well watching more rugby exploring other rugby options what I would have to do to play for England what the criteria was like I didn't I didn't know anything how it worked and the main thing I found out is that you had to play for a premiership club um so I sent an email to the person in charge of rugby at, at Harlequin's new women's section and she said yeah you can come along like we'll have a look at you it's turned up a couple of sessions and Nobody told and by me. By this point, you've basically learnt the rules. You've managed to, to conquer the rules at all? Uh, no, no, no. No, just catch the ball, run forwards. I didn't even have to pass backwards because as, as the coaches saw, especially at like at Quinn's, I could catch and I was strong enough to just muscle my way through most most of the other girls, most of the other women. And so my role was to lift in the line out, catch the ball and run, and literally don't pass the ball. So no, didn't didn't have a grasp of of too many, <laughs> and even now I I still struggle. Um, and again, like turn up to a few sessions, and nobody told me not to come back. So I just kept coming to the point where a few of the coaches was like, "Oh, you still you still coming then? Uh, are we are you here to stay?" And I was like, "Well, yeah. Nobody's told me not to." And I was like, "Okay, fine. You can you can stay." Uh, and then we can fast forward a couple of seasons. No, no, I want to stay on that team bit for oh, a sec. There we go. Because I think that's because when you're when you're everything you've said about yourself, you are single-minded, you are determined, 
Uh, a bit like watching you run forward with a ball. It's kind of how you lead your life. Yeah. Nobody's going to get in your way. It's mine to have, and I'm going to get it, and I'm going to keep it, and it's mine. Yeah. And that's that's not any of the words you use when you talk about team, you talk about collaboration, you talk about share, you talk about empowerment, you talk about facilitate, you talk about enable. These are not words I hear in your vocabulary. So how yeah. did that meld for you to actually be a team player that, I mean, maybe you are loathed by everybody. Does everybody you play with you hate you? Uh, a rumour is not, but I mean, it could just be a rumour. Not that I'm aware. I think people quite like me, actually. I'm not oh, sure. Really? So how did you how did you learn that to be that team player? So you are you are on a team of of fifteen, and it's the bit where no matter how great of a game I might have or have had, no matter how great of a training session I've had, no matter how well prepared I am, if fourteen other of our teammates are not in a good place, it, it doesn't matter. You can't play rugby. You can't do a team sport by yourself. And your success relies on other people. And so the options are you just you just have a moan at, at them or, or maybe even behind their back, which doesn't solve the problem. Or you, you get them on board and ask if they need help, ask what I can do to, to make you more prepared or make you know more about the game plan, help you to be a better rugby player. And equally, they do the same for me. Like, I constantly lean on teammates. I'm always the one asking questions. Like, I'm always the one asking for help. And them being able to bring me up is, is the huge benefit of being in a team. And equally, like, you, you can do the same for them. And there's, as even a, for me, there's a privilege in seeing someone turn up in, in one state of mind that's not not such a good state of mind and being able to change them and change their day and, and change their outlook on the day and make them feel better about themselves like that's that's an honor for me and I, I enjoy that part as well I mean that is team teamwork in whatever context is an absolute lesson for life um but I love the fact that your teamwork and your driver for your teamwork is so that you can still win yeah yeah because you, you just have to win don't you there's, yeah. there's no question about that yeah and, and there's space for for enjoyment and I say enjoyment winning is enjoyment for me but I understand that some people do sport for participation they do it for social reasons they do it because it gets them out of the house that that's good I I never used to understand that and it would blow my mind that people were okay with losing but as I've as I've matured and grown up I've realized that it's okay for people to just want to participate it's okay for people to just just want to go for a walk and that's enough for them a couple of times a week and even in your job role if we're like we switch over to, to careers and in offices and everyday lives like it's okay to just sort of bob along if if you want to um I would always encourage a bit more but like you can just no, do I don't think either of us are bob along types really no no and, and I find it difficult for you to even hear you say it's okay to bob along. But that's probably what makes me not a great leader or manager. What are you doing bobbing along? That's all you're about, bob off. But no, no, I'm, you know, there, you're absolutely right in saying there's a place for every type of motivation. Mm -hmm. And um, um, so you've learned to play as a team. You've got yourself into your professional, your premiership club. How do you get England to knock on your door? Or is this another typical Shauna move? Can I play for England, please? <laughs> to be fair, it was not far off. So as soon as I got to Quinn's, I was, well, I say as soon as, probably like a season in, I was saying to the coaches, just to let you know, I do want to play for England one day. And I was like, yeah, 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 cool. Like, just keep doing what you're doing. And so the way England players are selected in the beginning is the coaches would watch the games, whether it be on video or in real life. Um, and the the head coach at the time, Simon Middleton, did come along to to one of our games, and someone said, "Oh, like the England head coach is over there." So me and my no shame self, I just took took a walk along. I said, "Hello, I've heard your name, Simon." He's like, "Yeah." I, said, I just just want to let you know, I intend to play for England one day, and I intend for you to be my boss at some point. And he just laughed, and I was like, mm, "No, I'm being serious." <laughs> He said, never in my life has somebody come over and said that to me. I said, well, here we are. <laughs> I'm not saying right now, but I do intend to play for you at some point. 
in the next few months or years. I was on my firefighter course, which meant I, three months, I wasn't at training Monday to Friday, so I could still play games on the weekend, but I was on a three month firefighter residential training course. And apparently that was good for me. And that was good for my game because I was playing some of the best rugby I'd played since I got there. And I got, got a phone call when I was on my firefighter training course to say, what, what are you doing next week? And actually the answer was, oh, I'm a bit busy. I'm on my training course. And it was Matt Ferguson, so the forwards coach at the time. And he said, what's the chances of you being able to get some time off? I said, oh, I'm not going to lie to you. It's never been done before. But I'm going to ask. Because again, I've got no shame. And ultimately the answer was, yes, you can have a, I think it was just one week, you can have a week off. And yeah, I got had a week, well, like three or four days in, in England camp and then made the squad that week and came off the bench at what, what was Allianz Park, Saracens, home of Saracens, England versus Canada, uh, 17th of November 2021, I guess, which was less than two years after I had my first game of rugby 15s, of rugby. So you started playing in 2015, did you say? You started... Yeah, so I started training with Medway in summer of 2015. And I you go then to this, see this England match and decide that's me. Yeah, in... well, I, well I, then, I also stopped playing rugby for the, the winter because I went up to Scotland to do my diver training course. Of course which, you did. Uh, yeah, no, exactly. And I, I forgot to put that in there because these things are very <laughs> not extraordinary in my life. But yeah, I was up in Scotland for three months. So again, not playing rugby. Um, And then it was when I came back, I had... I think I got back on the Thursday and I was playing on the Sunday at Flanker, not a Scooby-Doo what was going on either. Um, and that was December 2015 is when I, that was that first game. And you're playing for England 2021. Did you say 2021? 2017, less than two 2017, years. 2017, you're playing for England. You're two years down. You go on. So what did it feel like putting on the kit, the England strip, getting out there? Uh, as as we've spoken about, I'm quite single minded, and once I've got a goal in my head that I need to achieve, then then I'm gonna do it. It it was just about being elite and being the best that you can be as an individual at at your sport, at your position, um, whatever it is it, and and maybe in the workplace. But yeah, it was it was just another rugby game, and I I learned that the type of person I am. Because people ask me, do you get nervous before a game? And do you treat a Quinns game different to how you treated an England game? And actually, for me, I just played every game of rugby. In fact, every half of rugby, like it was my last. And it was just rugby. And I know I'm good at rugby. And yes, there's bits, there's detail around who goes where, etc. But it's ultimately catch the ball, run forwards. And that, that was my game. And that still is my game. And it, it works a treat. And that first game, did you win? Yes, and Jess Reach scored six tries. So I do remember that. I nearly scored on my on my first cap. I didn't. So that was the end of that one. But you know, we, we did. We did. Yeah. You didn't. Jess did. You didn't. That's yes, probably did. how it goes. Yes. Times. Yeah, that was yeah. pretty good for her. Pretty, pretty impressive. So fast forward, how long did you play for England? Five years, 2017. Yeah, 20, November 2017, first game for England. November 20. Two last game for England, so pretty much five years to the day. What's that like? The goodbye, the uh, goodbye to the high. It it was mixed because when I had my last game, it, it was a World Cup final. Pretty cool way to to finish your last game, even though we lost. And also, like the number thirty, it's a nice round number. It's just like it all married up so so nicely. It was a, it was a good ending because then the final game was for Harlequins. And everyone did know that was my last game. So then that was a nice cherry on top to play, to win um, and to play well. For I, I deem myself to play well. So that was happy days. So oh, that, that's that's international rugby over for you, is it? Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, you're still playing domestic rugby? Yes, I am for Harlequins. And still loving it? Most of the time, yeah. Although it's just started snowing today and it doesn't, doesn't bode well. And I think... Got to go outside and play tomorrow. Um, but no, I, <laughs> I, I'm glad. I, I'm glad I'm still playing for club, and it gives me um, almost like still a foundation to to exist. And that might sound sound a bit too much, but 
actually like I do loads of things off pitch and I do loads around equality around women equality of opportunity inclusion diversity and I like to stay true to, to where I came from because it was I mean I think I had a great well I had a great childhood and we never went without it in terms of but my without is very different to someone who's privileged without so we always had food on the table there was always heating in the house and we were never homeless or anything like that but actually that's quite a low bar to set but I remember having the most fantastic childhood. Into some good meaty stuff about the real fibre of Shauna. You, you, I'm just going to read crap. So you have been a British gas engineer. Yep. You've been a deep sea diver. Yep. You've trained for and you've been a firefighter. Yep. In your 36 years, as well as being an international athlete. Yeah, I'm only 33 though. Oh my God, sorry, I've just <laughs> aged you by three years. I miscounted. <laughs> Tiny baby, 33-year-old, those, those fantastic, powerful jobs. Yeah. Um, but now you're you're not doing any of those, despite all the training that went into them. Months and months of training to get those tickets and to get those qualifications. And the focus of your work, you know, when I Google you and I see what you're speaking about and talking about, is, and I, you know, I, I, there's, there's stuff around racism in rugby, but your single-minded focus at the moment seems to be calling people out yeah calling out sections of society calling out people and not being afraid to say this actually isn't isn't right and this isn't how you do it is that in any way accurate or have I misread what I've been reading no it's uh, the general concept is accurate I I just wouldn't call it calling out um and actually like I, I find it interesting how other people see it and whether it's calling out or whether people describe me as an activist or whatever however they want to call me for me it's just about honesty and I do like I'll have a conversation with, with a friend or or a colleague or a, a fellow player about a subject and then I'll hear them speak to a journalist a coach another player and I'm like you did not just say that to me about that like why 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 have you changed what you're saying because that's not what you think like I know you was honest with me so just be honest with them um, and and there is a acknowledging there's an element of bravery to my honesty and it goes against me in terms of when because I work with a lot a lot of different brands and a lot of different organizations and I'm sure it would go against me in terms of some brands don't want me on board because of how I speak and sometimes actually my accent of where I'm from um but also what I say how I say it you can still be polite and be real or you can be not rude and be real but I, I honestly, I just see it as, as answering it. I'm just answering a question that people have asked. But actually, if you saw my social media of of me, just of what I put out off my own back, a lot of it is is just about positivity. It's about shining a light where the light is not normally being shined on. And like, I don't say, I, I would deem that I don't say controversial things. It, I can be guilty of being in an echo chamber where I'm around other strong, independent women who get it or strong, independent people of colour who understand. And then we're like, yeah, we're, we're changing the world. Like we're in a good place. But then actually I go to a room that is not, is not my room. It's not full of female rugby players. It's not full of... I don't know, female chief execs, whatever it is. And I'm like, damn, there's still so much work to do. In terms of your own experience as a woman, as a black woman in a sport that traditionally, I don't actually know enough about shot putting and discus to say whether it's the same, um, but certainly rugby traditionally has been seen as quite white, quite elite, mm -hmm. very male. Yeah. And, and I do see that changing and... Certainly, I see it changing in the young people that we work with in Delalio Rugby Works. I see it changing in, you know, powerhouses who, who become the sort of uh, union representative in people like Ashton Hewitt, who I've spoken to. I see it changing, um, but, but change is slow and, and change happens when you're in the middle of it. So what was your experience of being in that sport, in that environment um, and, and coming from two outside perspectives? Yeah, it, it was a it was a big culture shock because I I'd grown up in a primary school where and a secondary school, grown up in schools in South London. There's a bit of everything, loads of different languages, loads of different colours, loads of different hair types, 
as different cultures, foods coming together, the way people dress. Coming into rugby, whoa, culture shock. Everyone's white for a start. Um, a lot of people sound very different to me, but they sound similar to each other. Um, a lot of people listen to the same type of music as each other, different to what I would listen to. Cultural references, it was so different and it was very isolating. Even the alcohol thing in rugby for me is a big deal, how how much alcohol is involved in the sport. And that because I'm not even that, like I'm not a big drinker. I don't I don't go out to get drunk. Like I have one or two, but I don't go out to get drunk. And that whole down in pipes at the end of the game, isolating. And and not because of religious reasons or not because I didn't agree with alcohol. Like I just it just wasn't my thing. And then you'd get the songs sung at you for not down in pints in the comments. And they, they don't mean any harm at all. People are not being like, oh, Shona doesn't drink, let's make her feel like she doesn't belong. But that is how it feels. And there are a few role models in the game, but the fact that you can still point to role models in the game says that there's not enough. Yeah. And actually at, at, at Quinn's, we had a, a game in October, which is obviously Black History Month, and there was five of us on the pitch, people of colour on the pitch playing for Quinns at the same time, which was just like a, again, yeah, like we're doing the right thing here. Work needs to be done, but like it's going the right way. And I'd always want change a lot quicker than it's coming and it is very slow. And I, I'd also separate the men's game and the women's game. The women's game is a lot more, has a lot more different types of people and in particular school and socioeconomic background. So the men's game, I would suggest that it's still a lot about where you go to school and if your parents can drive you somewhere. And mm. and I say parents as well, because like that's that's normal. Heaven forbid, like you've got your auntie looking after you for whatever reason, or maybe you're in foster care, adoption, whatever it is. But the women's game is certainly in a better place in terms of variety of people who play than the men's. Um, and it, it does break me when I when I see academy lists come out from men's teams and like our oh, congratulations to our 12 boys who have graduated to our senior academy program and you look at 12 boys and of the 12 eight of them go to the same school and you think yeah. something your catchment area you're going to have tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of boys available to you and you're telling me 12 of the best rugby players you can find eight of them come from the same school something fishy here um so yeah that that troubles me but I just I just have to keep keep doing me, keep being me, keep talking it, keep saying it out loud. Because like some people don't even think about that kind of thing. They're like, oh yeah, that's cool. They go to the same school. Rugby players must be really good at that school. You're like, mm, no, it's just because that's where they're shopping for them. Um there's no doubt now that you are yourself a role model. Um you you do a lot with brands, you've got a lot of endorsements, you know, you're a voice, you're public speaking, you're shouting out loud and proud about the discrimination that's experienced in sport, the discrimination that women experience, the discrimination that black women experience, women of colour. Um, and you are out there. And, and I know, and the reason you're doing this podcast is because I think you're a role model to the young women that we work with, a role model to me. Who were your role models? Who did you go? You said your mum. Yeah. You've talked about John. I get asked this question a lot. And actually, it's like, who did you look up to growing up? And it and it was it was mum yeah it wasn't and people say oh yeah like what about your sports stars or sports fans? I said nah I didn't and maybe we're back to the single-mindedness even now I don't really watch that much sport maybe it's because when I look at who who was doing sport like I didn't see myself and actually I'll always remember one of the only posters I had up in my room like do you remember posters yeah the only posters I put up in my room was Miss Dynamite and is it a coincidence she's a mixed race female from a similar area of the country from me? I don't I don't think so. But I didn't put that up like, oh, yeah, look, she's a mixed race female. I'm going to put her on my wall. It was like, that's Miss Dynamite and she's cool. So she's going on my wall. Um, so, yeah, I didn't I didn't look up to anyone who who wasn't around me. Like I didn't have sports stars that I looked up to pop stars or people I was like yeah I want to be like her and even like Miss Dynamite it was, it was a poster I was just like it's a cool poster I'm putting on my wall it was I'd never wanted to be into music or anything like that um but then in terms of who gen like my role models in life who have molded me to the person I am today yeah two of the people are a mum and and then John Hillier my coach 
Um, and they've done a good job, Sean. Let me let me put that out there. I would I would agree on this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you know yourself. You know what you're good at. Um, I, I dread to ask you what you're bad at, so I'm not going to. Netball uh, because netball, well, and basketball, the whole ball in the hoop thing. Not for Can't do balls in hoops. No. Can't run very fast. No. No. Can't down pints. We've already established that. Down if if you see that as a life skill, it's one you haven't got. <laughs> Probably one that's, that's not a bad one to skip out on, but, you know. Um, in terms of, we're going to wrap up now. Um, so a couple of things. What are you reading or watching at the minute? Um, it was, I actually can't remember the name. I can read it on my Kindle, so I don't see the front cover. But it's one about a woman doctor in prison. Is it a truth? Is it true? Is yeah, it... yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a it's a true bits of uh basically the diaries of a a female doctor who was in you know civilized well, civilization um in the in the normal world and then she wanted to change her life and she became a doctor in prisons and then particularly in female prisons and it's just listening to her experiences of being a doctor who was from a completely separate world to nearly all of these women in prison that she's treating and just hearing yeah someone's in prison but actually their backstory you think you, you've done well to still be alive do you know what I mean yeah. more than anything and your favorite food I'm going to take you out for a slap up meal what are we having Chinese buffet all you can eat order off the menu not that I thought about it or anything or have that as a go-to answer but it's very important that it's order off the menu as well because it's fresh not, oh, not right, okay. So yeah. you want to be able to eat literally everything off the Chinese menu? Yeah. You, yeah. See, you make yourself something wrong with that, Senna. <laughs> no, 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 because I'm right there with you. We're going <laughs> to leave together on a monosodium glutamate high. Okay. So yeah. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to our to our dinner. Um, and just, just as you go, we work with young people who've, you know, actually had pretty awful backgrounds, some of them, but they are determined because they are getting involved with the programme. And the minute you take that step, that actually means that you are committing to doing something different with your life. What are you going to say to them? Keep going. It will be hard. You will question yourself on a weekly basis, certainly on a monthly basis, maybe even on a daily basis. Am I good enough for this? Can I keep going with this? And the answer is, do you want to? Yes, well, then you can keep going and you will keep going and you will learn and you will grow and you will feel awkward and you will feel a sense of not belonging at times and you will think, why am I even bothering? But you're involved in something now. You have a, there is a sense of belonging available to you and there is, there is light at the end of the tunnel, but sometimes you just got to dig your own tunnel. And if that means you've got to get on your hands and hands and knees and dig with your hands because you don't have the correct tools available. You've not been gifted the silver spoon in your mouth at birth. And actually, you can't even use that spoon to dig a hole. Sometimes you just got to get down and dirty and, and do it yourself and just keep asking questions, keep making challenges. And if the if the doors are not being opened for you in life, smash them in. You can knock nicely first, but if nobody's answering, smash them in and just walk inside. And Shauna Brown, that is certainly what you have done today and what I have no doubt you are going to carry on doing. Thank you for taking part in Rugby Works Talks. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me.